So what do we have here? We have a painting on canvas in oil. Um, it's about two and a half meters wide. So it's quite a, a big picture. Um, and so the figure scale of the, uh, of the individual figures is not quite life size, but um, fairly large. Um, it's um, painted, as I say, around 1665 to 1670. So in the latter part of the 17th century. Uh, and it was painted in Seville in Southern Spain. Um, by Murillo. So we are looking at a large number of figures. If we start from the left, we have this wonderful group of, uh, of men dressed in all three primary colors. So we have um, uh, uh, one of them in the, in the distance, he's, he's in yellow, the one sort of in the middle is in red, and the one closest to us who's kneeling um, is, is in blue. Um, of course, these colours working very well together, uh, certainly being in Murillo's uh, mindset when he painted this. Um, the idea of spatial depth is already kind of created with the, the layering of these three figures. So we have this one figure in the background, another who's sort of leaning down slightly, um, and another who's kneeling. So not only do we get a sense of recession, uh, but also a sense of, of, of height different sort of stepping heights um, um, within these three figures. Um, the, the, the kneeling figure, we can see the sole of his uh, right boot um, in the corner, in the lower left corner of the painting there. Um, separating that group of figures and the other larger group of figures is a stone well um, with a rope sort of dangling into it. And uh, the figure that's kneeling on the well um, in this sort of, sort of pinky color is holding onto the rope in both hands, uh, which you can see leads our eye up to um, this boy in white and um, the rope is sort of tethered around his waist. Um, held, holding him are two other figures. Again, this sort of combination of pinky red, blue and yellow. Um, these two figures holding uh, holding him, one dressed in yellow, one dressed in red, very much uh, giving us the impression that he is headed for the well. Uh, they, one of them is looking down into the well um, and the other one is looking at it as well from, from a distance. Um, while the, 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 the younger boy, well, seemingly younger boy, um, is turned very much away from the well, not wanting to, to go where he's headed, um, looking in the other direction, with his arm reaching up into the sky. And that in turn then leads our eye to this next group of figures. Um, we can see this brilliant expression uh, from the, the figure in, in the pinky tunic, um, with, who's sort of turning towards the boy with this very, um, uh, very expressive look on his face, um, or, or, which, which I think we'll come to, but I think which is almost the sort of strongest expression in the composition personally. And then in contrast, the man next to him in this um, sort of greeny cloak, but perhaps was once blue, may have discolored, um, is a, a much gentler expression from the, the man standing next to him. Um, and then there are two other figures, one of whom we can see in profile, um, and the other we can see uh, turning away from us, holding a, a shepherd's crook in his left hand, um, a, a, a multicolored multi uh, piece of fabric or cloak or coat of some sort with a, a spectacular orange lining. And then um, there's a, a dog who's also looking up at the, the face of this man dressed in what looks like green. Um, and then in the foreground, there's a sort of empty space uh, with this beautiful basket and uh, a loaf of bread wrapped in uh, fabric um, and the fabrics cascading over the edge of the basket there. We've got a lovely combination of um, organic matter, um, of course, with the, um, the, the rocks um, and, and then this sort of, um, this sort of moment of domesticity uh, poised in the middle of the, of, the, uh, of the foreground or in the, on the right side of the foreground. Um, and then in the distance, what feels almost like a, a kind of very stormy sea, 
but is in fact a mountainous landscape. Um, it's almost a, a sort of a abstracted in, in that we can't quite tell exactly what we're looking at, but it's uh, distant hills and mountains um, in a kind of greenish blue um, with uh, a flock of, of sheep, uh, larger sheep we can see in the foreground, I'm just going to move in a little bit, um, who are actually quite well defined and then lot, a lot more sheep uh, as 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 um, as we move into the distance, and then some sort of snow capped uh, mountains in in the distance there as well. So I think immediately we have a real sense of personally, I feel like we have a a real sense of space um, and depth in the picture, and that is achieved by placing these figures um, very much kind of one in front of the other. Um, as well, of, co uh, of course, as, as sort of placing them in sequence side by side. Um, we have a very colourful palette um, across all of the, uh, the drapery. We've, we've mentioned that already. Um, but there is a, a, a very clear um, moment almost at the centre of the canvas. Um, and that is this, this boy that's being held um, by by the 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 two men um, either side of him who is dressed in white and he feels certainly feels very luminous to me um, the the moment uh, at the center of the canvas is certainly the one that we are uh, intended to be kind of looking at and that's very much um, not only in terms of its placement and of course the subject matter but that's enhanced by the way in which the picture has been painted uh, he's dressed in white his skin tone is very pale. Um, and uh, and so our eye is, is certainly drawn there. Um, and of course, the white of his clothes clothes is picked up again um, in the in the white in the white in the foreground. So again, giving an idea or a sense of space. So the title has probably given the subject away to many of you, and um, you may even recognize the subject, those of you who knows know your Old Testament stories. Um, so this is the story of, of Joseph, uh, son of Jacob, and um, one of 12 boys. Um, and this is uh, told in the book of Genesis. And this is the moment that Maria is painting here that Joseph has been stripped of his, um, his colorful uh, uh, coat or cloak that he was given by his father, Jacob. Um, for being his preferred child, his favorite child. Um, and out of the pure emotion of jealousy, um, he, is being, he is being thrown into a well. Now, um, the, the, the sort of lead up to this moment is that, um, that, that Jacob, um, his father, had, had created this, this, had made this uh, coat for Joseph and um, this was to the, to the envy, much to the envy of his brothers um, who already were aware of Jacob's favoritism. Uh, Joseph um, clearly riled them even more by telling them about two dreams that he had had, which I think if anyone was told the dreams that he was uh, telling them about, they would have probably been a little bit peeved as well. He, he said he had a dream that, um, that a, he was a sheaf of corn and that 11 sh other sheafs of corn were bowing down to him. Um, and that his second dream was that the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to him as well. So um, he certainly was aware of his privileged position um, among his siblings. And um, he had been given this, this coat, much the envy of the brothers. So the brothers all took themselves out uh, to the hills um, in Canaan, which is where um, which is where the the story is set, and they were they were uh, in the hills with their flock, um, with their flocks probably plural, um, and Joseph had been sent by his father Jacob to find them or to check on them and see if they were what they were up to. And as he approached, the brothers decided that they were going to kill him. Um, and they were going to do so by killing, they were going to kill him and throw him into a well um, and so that he wasn't able to be found. However, one of the brothers who was quite kind hearted was 
I'm pretty sure this brother, and I'm interpreting that purely because I think he looks like the most kind-hearted, and this is the moment that's being portrayed here, um, that Reuben, this kind-hearted brother, uh, tells or persuades the other brothers not to kill him, but simply to leave him in the well and give him no food and water, um, and uh, then they wouldn't have their blood, his blood on their hands. And I say I'm interpreting it because I haven't been able to find anywhere um, something that tells me uh, that that, that, um, that is indeed Ruben. This painting isn't a particularly famous painting by Murillo, um, and so it's not particularly easy to find a huge amount on it. Um, but I think this is Ruben. This is Ruben saying, um, just leave him in the well, don't kill him first. And so this is the moment that they're putting him down there. And then his intention was to then go and collect him later um, and save him from, from dying. So this is the kind brother Reuben. However, what happens after this moment is that Judah, one of the other brothers, who I am not sure, I can't identify from, um, from, from a guess, um, he actually sells um, uh, Joseph to um, some travelers who are moving through on their way to Egypt. Um, and he's sold to them uh, for 20 pieces of silver into slavery. And then of course, the story goes on. Um, in summary, Joseph arrives in Egypt. Um, he's taken into being a steward to Potiphar, who was a member of the Pharaoh's uh, or Pharaoh's guard. Um, and uh, he, he, he's steward to him. So I suppose a kind of assistant. Um, to Potiphar, and then you have the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife, uh, which which is often depicted in 17th century, um, and uh, and and then um, eventually he becomes governor of Egypt, um, and is responsible for handing out supplies and goods during the famine, and this group of brothers, his brothers, come to him uh, at the moment. Um, or the time of the famine, asking him for, um, for, for supplies. Um, and he welcomes them with open arms and they settle with his brother, with his father, Jacob in Egypt. Um, and I suppose is seen as a, a sort of a figure of, of forgiveness um, and, and of great virtue. And I think Joseph is very much seen as uh, a sort of prefigure to uh, Christ in the New Testament. So that sort of gives you a, um, a, an overview of, of Joseph, who is, of course, the figure that we are looking at dressed in white um, in the middle of the painting. Um, you'll see down lower right that his um, Technicolor dream coat, which I'm sure many of you uh, know from Andrew Lloyd Webber's musical, um, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, which, which Lloyd Webber wrote when he was 20 years old, I realized um, when I was uh, looking, looking, researching this painting um, and the musical. Um, so this is the Technicolor Dreamcoat in Murillo's eyes, um, as I say, with this fabulous lining, but it's certainly not the focus of the painting. Um, Joseph is. I think Firstly, if we look at it kind of compositionally, we've talked a bit about the space and the um, the way that Maria has created both depth um, and, of course, uh, a, a sense of sort of sequence from left to right. Um, but I think there's incredibly strong composition here. Uh, if we follow the rope um, moving up towards this figure in yellow, which then kind of is pulled back down in the crook of the shepherd on the right, you have quite a strong uh, triangular composition at the center here. So it, it brings the focus of the, of the painting, the, 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 the focus of the subject um, is, is positioned at the apex of a triangle. So uh, I think that's probably the first thing to, to note. And, and that shape is created by the rope, but also by this sequence of hands uh, that we can see. So, um, again, so many hands. If, if, if all you focus on in this painting is hands, uh, it, it's amazing what you see. Um, and we have this wonderful sequence of hands that build all the way right up to this hand here, which actually is, um, is quite beautifully silhouetted against the sky and is 
quite a, a lot of attention is sort of given to it, which whether or not that's a, um, a gesture towards uh, Joseph's um, holiness or um, you know, re connection or relationship with, um, with God the Father, I'm not sure, but um, it certainly draws our attention to this figure here, who in my view, and as I always say, please share what you feel in the chat, this is the figure that we're talking about in our emotion series. This is the figure for me that personifies jealousy. Um, he has an air uh, of, um, of, uh, uh, of sort of not caring about him, but he certainly cares and he feels very bitter to me. He feels like he's stepping away from this situation um, uh, and, and sort of persuading himself that it was the right thing to do. Um, and I think while we're on that, you know, the different emotions that we do get from each of the individual figures is so, um, they're so varied. And I think a bit like, our, again, our session on grief, um, as, a, as a sort of palette, I suppose, of different emotions or responses to difficult situations, I think this is um, very successful. I think there are a number of ways in which the painting's not hugely successful. I think, although he layers them, um, they often aren't particularly, um, it's not particularly successful in the way that he does that. Um, I think particularly in this group here, it feels, um, I, I'm not hugely convinced um, by particularly the, the relationship between these two figures who sort of feel like they're sort of superimposed one in front of the other. Um, however, I do think that the different expressions of emotion are, are really very um, impressive and um, of course, we have pure sort of jealousy and bitterness here. Um, I feel like there's a sort of doggedness and determination um, with, with these two figures that are, are sort of getting the job done. Um, there's a, a, a figure on the right here. Well, this figure that we mentioned earlier. Um, sorry, I just have to move my, um, my screen around to see the figures on the right. Um, the this figure here, of course, is um, who we're 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 uh, calling Reuben, who is hesitant, very hesitant and very concerned uh, with with what what's going on. Um, and I think, you know, others, for example, the this group around him, I don't also feel like they're giving it a huge amount of thought what's what's actually happening. They're just sort of get, getting on with it. Um, so and, and again, this figure on the far left. Um, we have a, a, a sort of not getting involved, facing away, sort of disbelief, taking a back seat. Uh, these two are clearly kind of conversing with one another um, while he's assisting. I don't know, is there hesitation between them? But um, it, all, it all adds to the sort of richness of the painting um, to sort of try to read into the expressions and the feelings of, um, of the different figures that we're, we're looking at. The figure in profile on the far right, I'm not sure, is he angry at Reuben for suggesting um, not to kill him? Um, or is he, uh, is he, is he just um, it's sort of looking at, in disbelief at, at what's unfolding in front of him? I'm, I'm not quite sure. I think one charming detail is the dog who is looking up uh, for some sort of reassurance um, uh, from 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 Reuben, who's standing who's standing uh, behind him, um, he's clearly kind of picking up on on the situation. Is concerned with 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 what's going on. Um, so I think so. Those are the the sort of um, the the triangle. Going back to the composition, that's the the, the triangle I was talking about. We have this, these lovely, again, these lovely um, shepherd's crooks really allow um, the, the kind of uh, attention to be pulled into the middle as well, uh, coming from, from either side. Again, we talked about the hands. Uh, the whole composition is framed by two figures facing away from us, facing inwards. Um, again, not only to give an idea of depth, but also to, um, to frame the, the picture on either side. Um, which all helps sort of concentrate the the, um, the sort of energy into the into the middle. Um, I find it interesting personally that the well has been positioned where it is. Um, perhaps that was to enable this uh, this sort of rope to um, to to draw attention to the figure of of Joseph. 
um, and the way that he's sort of pulled, I suppose, between you know the well where he's about to go and um, and this other uh, the other side, whether it's where he's come from or even um, what we mentioned earlier, the heavens um, above. But he's sort of in a, very much in a transient place. He's in a um, in a in a in a middle space. Um, uh, and 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 I think that adds to the excitement and the tension in the painting is that this is very much a moment in time. This is not when the job's been done or when it's being plotted. This is um, in the middle of the in the middle of the action. And I think that's enhanced as well by this uh, very dynamic, uh, sort of turbulent landscape. Uh, it's a very interesting. I was trying to think about whether or not the the skies were stormy and I think certainly on the right side um, there's this sort of stormy very ominous uh, sky or, or and weather um, and then on the left you have uh, much more sort of light and promise um, and a kind of more of a hopeful uh, hopeful um, uh, atmosphere um, so but all of it sort of adds to the drama and the tension and then, of course, the light and the direction of light, um, it comes from sort of upper left um, and it's lighting the figures very dramatically. We've talked already about um, the, the sort of luminosity of, um, of Joseph at the centre, um, but also notice how the light is hitting the, uh, the, the, the skin of the various brothers. Um, and again, not helped by the glare which is what you get from um, uh, the glare of this on this picture, which is these sort of mottled, these spots um, here, which is just where the lights caught the picture of the canvas when the photograph's been taken. So it's not best quality reproduction, but you do get a sense of the light um, uh, hitting the various points of their faces and their body and that bodies. And that certainly um, adds to the, again, to the, the drama um, of the of the moment and of the of the story. Um, so, I mean, this is a painting that was was painted really sort of right at the peak of Murillo's um, career. It was painted, as I say, in in around 1670, um, and uh, Murillo dies in 1682. So this is very much in the latter part of his career. He was born in 1618. Um, in, in Seville um, and his career really kind of goes through a transformation in the 1650s um, and then it's from then that he really enjoys uh, immense success. Um, he, was, he was born, um, uh, as I say, in Seville or a nearby town called Pilas, I think is how you say it. Um, he, he then was actually orphaned, his two, uh, his two, both his, both his parents uh, died uh, when he was just 10 years old, um, sort of in consecutive years. So he was taken in by his sister and her husband and he actually lived with them until 1645. So he, he lived with them for, for some time um, and ended up being the executor to his uh, brother-in-law's will, so was clearly very close to his sister and, and uh, brother-in-law. And um, he, he then, he was, uh, he was then mar he married a, a, a lady called um, uh, Beatrice, and um, he married her in 1645, which is when, when he left the, 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 home, the family home. Um, uh, but before this, he had been training with uh, an artist who was indeed his uncle and godfather called Juan del Castillo. Um, and he was uh, really the kind of overwhelming influence on Murillo's early paintings. Um, he was a very, um, quite a sort of dry painter, um, quite sort of uh, sculptural and smooth forms. And Murillo's early works were kind of dominated uh, by this, which certainly we don't see in this picture, which if we're looking at execution, this is um, very dramatic, uh, broad brushstrokes, very loosely painted. And again, um, you know, the, the, the quality of the image isn't good enough, but let me draw attention to this, your attention to this hand here, um, which is, is a great uh, sort of case, case in point. Um, so he's, he's overwhelmingly influenced by, by his sort of, his master in, in these early years. And then uh, he, 
starts gaining some major commissions. In, in 1645, he's commissioned to um, paint 11 canvases. This is his first major commission, um, a series of 11 canvases for a, um, a convent of San Francesco, Fran San Francisco, I suppose, um, in Seville. Um, and, uh, and then in, in the mid 1650s, he starts doing some works or making some works for Seville Cathedral. Um, so, so his career certainly picks up. And, and you notice that um, throughout his, his life, he's very much, his patrons are religious institutions and he himself was religious um, and he was more often than not painting religious paintings for um, religious institutions, be it convents or churches, uh, cathedrals. Um, and, uh, and, and, so, and so that sort of defines his work. Whereas someone like Velasquez, who was his contemporary, also from Seville, he goes to Madrid in 1623 and he works for the court there, for the royal court. And that sort of defines his career, which was a kind of um, naturally more sort of secular uh, environment um, working for for the court in um, in Madrid, um, but that said, Murillo actually does go to Madrid. He's in Seville pretty much his whole life, um, but he does go to Madrid in in 1658. We know that he he makes a trip to to M Madrid, and there he would have seen works by not only Velasquez but also uh, by Titian. Um, Titian had worked for, for the Habsburgs um, in the previous century um, and also works by Rubens um, and Van Dyck, so the Flemish painters. So uh, he would have been kind of strongly uh, influenced by sort of Italian and Flemish artists. Um, and it wasn't only here that he would have been because Seville was at the time a, a major sort of trading spot. Um, it, it suffered quite a lot of um, or an economic downturn in the middle of the 17th centuries and that the river that runs through the city actually silted up, which meant that the trade shifted from Seville uh, down onto the coast to Cadiz. And so um, it, even though it had been a center of trade, it kind of the center moved down to Cadiz. Um, and that's where his clients then and, and patrons sort of ended up um, towards the end of his life. Um, and in fact, he was working on um, a, a capuchin um, a commission in a capuchin church at the end of his life when he when he uh, when he died. Um, the the, the rumour or the the, this, the the wives tale is that he um, that, that he actually fell from the scaffolding um, when he was painting a, um, a painting of the marriage of St. Catherine in this church. And that's how he died in 1682. But. Um, I don't think that's been uh, qualified with any documentation. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so he would have seen because of this sort of trading spot being both Seville and Cadiz, he would have had um, not only um, there would it, not only would it have been somewhere that, uh, of course, paintings of of, of different schools would have been uh, moving through, uh, but also. Um, he would have had merchant clients, and we know he had merchant clients of Dutch and Flemish clients that were based in Cadiz um, that he was painting for, um, and and so he was familiar with with other schools of painting. Um, but that said, the kind of tenebristic qualities. So tenebrism meaning um, it's from the Italian tenebroso, which is um, sort of darkness and obscurity. Um, tenebris. Tenebrism is, is a bit like, um, it's a sort of uh, a way of describing works that are imbued with chiaroscuro, so this very strong uh, contrast between uh, light and shade. But these, these tenebristic qualities were very present in Spain um, in, in the works of artists like um, Zurbaran, Francisco de Zurbaran, um, and uh, another artist called Alonso Cano as well. So he was also having influences from from around him um but certainly from from sort of further north in europe as well and i think a painting like this personally for me uh, it speaks very much of of rubens um uh and i think you know not not only in its palette and in in the way in which it's um uh, it's it's um he's painting the 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 bodies the 
um, the, the anatomies of the figures, but also, um, the, the, like I say, the palette, um, but, but also the, the kind of strong light and darkness and, and just the way that he's approaching, um, he's approaching the, uh, the figures, I find, um, with these sort of rosy moments. Um, there's, there's a very kind of Rubensian feeling to the picture. Um, and this very loose brushwork, while of course is um, reminiscent of an artist like Rubens, uh, is also very much uh, familiar from, from Titian's painting, as is these bright colours, very, very much a Venetian quality. However, you look at something like this, and this is both very Flemish, uh, very Spanish, both, both of which, both countries, um, both Flanders and um, uh, and of course Holland, but um, also Spain uh, were very well known for for painting still lifes in this period. So he's managed to kind of uh, integrate a, a, an isolated still life within uh, within the larger narrative, the wider narrative um, of this of this painting. Um, typically, Murillo's works are very sweet. I've, I've mentioned that a lot of his work was for religious institutions. They were more often than not religious uh, paintings uh, for obvious reasons, mainly New Testament paintings. Um, and they were characterized by being very, um, or they are characterized by being very uh, sort of sweet paintings. And I think as the, the best way to describe them is that um, they were very popular in the 18th and 19th centuries. And in fact, he was really the only Spanish painter uh, from the 17th century to be known outside of Spain um, until the 19th century, really. He was popular in the, um, in the 18th century, and he was very much admired for this kind of sweetness that he, uh, that he, he gave his figures. He often painted young children, uh, street, uh, street children, street urchins, uh, beggars. Um, he painted a lot of young saints. Um, so he was, he was um, of course, painting religious painting, paint, uh, religious uh, works predominantly, but he was also depicting kind of the real life um, and some real life. And sometimes he was sort of merging the two. So often you'll find, um, uh, you, you know, in some paintings by Murillo, another in my mind in the Wallace collection, um, it, it's a religious painting, but you very much get a sense that he's painting from, from life and from, from characters and figures that he's seen um, out and about on, on the street. So the idea of these religious paintings, um, but that are also very natural, very naturalistic and quite real. And that very much spoke to a kind of counter-reformation um, sensibility and mindset, uh, which of course was kicked off in the mid 16th century. So post, post the reformation, the Catholic church um, held what was called the Council of Trent, which was from 1545 to 63. And during that time, the council met on a number of occasions and they sort of defined what the Catholic Church was. And a lot of art that followed that was a response to these kind of decrees, as it were, that had been laid out by the Council of Trend. And one of them was that the idea of through imagery, we can make the church accessible. So the opposite of what was happening in the Reformation. And in order to do that, they wanted to um, do away with kind of very, um, not always, but um, sort of dr dramatic martyrdom scenes of saints, and instead kind of bring in um, much more relatable uh, images. So you'll see a lot of um, immaculate conceptions, a lot of Madonna and the Madonna and child, and that's obviously sort of playing into a kind of maternal uh, sensibility between a mother and a child. And, um, and that's why I think Murillo's paintings play to that in the sense that he often paints religious paintings, but um, there's a real sort of human sense to them. And um, Ruskin, the, the 18th century um, art critic, artist, um, who I'm sure a number of you know, um, he, he, he calls his paintings uh, very mortal. So he talks about the idea of the religious paintings being very mortal. And I think um, that's, that's where they held huge appeal. Um, and it was for this that they were hugely appreciated in the, in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, 
in terms of the life of this picture, um, it was uh, actually amazingly commissioned by um, a, a Genoese merchant. So case in point about the merchant. So a merchant from, from Genoa um, in Northern Italy was living in, um, in, in Seville um, uh, or Cadiz, I can't remember, one of the two. And he commissioned this painting uh, along with two other paintings actually that are, that are also in the Wallace collection. Um, he had contacts with the studio and with the artist. Um, and he commissioned this painting, which perhaps explains why the composition is so unusual for Maria. It's a very unusual composition in terms of subject matter being an Old Testament subject, and also in this kind of overwhelming emotive quality. It's um, it's it's uh, it, it's it's not a it's not typical of his of his work. Um, so it may have been an instructive commission, perhaps. Um, this man was called Giovanni Bielato, and he then takes the paintings up to Genoa um, by 1674, they're in Genoa, in Genoa. Um, and then he bequeaths them to a Capuchin church or convent um, in 1681. Um, and it's from there that in the early 19th century in 1805, um, an English uh, art dealer acquires them through his Italian agent. Um, and they're bought by him, uh, sorry, they're bought from him by an English collector called John Cave um, in 1843, uh, sorry, until 1843 when he sells them at Christie's. And it's in the mid 19th century in 1843 that this and the other two paintings are acquired by the fourth Marquess of Hartford, um, who, whose collection is sort of, and the previous three Marquesses of Hartford um, their collection, the collection that they amassed, um, and the fourth Marcus's son, uh, Richard Wallace, or Ill illegitimate son, Richard Wallace, that was the sort of basis um, of, of what then became the, the Wallace collection. Um, and it's interesting, there's some interesting correspondence specifically about this painting uh, between um, a, a man called Samuel Mawson, who was the agent that was buying on behalf of the fourth Marquess um, and, and the fourth Marquess. And he says, um, he's, he, 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 the, the Marquess writes back to Samuel Mawson about this picture specifically, uh, saying, I like, I only like pleasing pictures um, and the subject of the one in question may not be quite to my taste. Uh, however, he was obviously persuaded to purchase the picture in the end, um, and it hangs in the, the Wallace collection uh, today. So I think that's um, a sort of an overview um, of, of both this picture and Murillo. Um, there is, uh, the, the, the Wallace collection has got an amazing collection of paintings by this artist and indeed Spanish collections in Spanish paintings in general. Um, and the National Gallery has a beautiful self-portrait of the artist at the age of 50. Um, and then there's another very famous self-portrait of him um, at the Frick at the age of 30. So it's quite nice, sort of 20 years apart. And the latter he actually um, paints for his uh, for his children, the one at the, 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 the later portrait, the one at the National Gallery. Um, we know that from an inscription uh, on the painting. Um, he had, I think, nine or ten children with his wife, only five of whom sort of outlived his wife. Uh, and then um, he lost two of his children, certainly in a huge plague that broke out in 1649, which killed, I think, almost half of Seville's uh, residents or inhabitants. Uh, so um, I think 60,000 people were killed by this, this plague um, and it took two of his sons. And then sadly his wife died in 1663, um, I think in childbirth. Um, so he was started his life on his own and, and then um, sort of ended it on his own as well. 